Hi, it's me, and today I'm going to be doing an overview of Refraction Railway Number 2 Mobius and the strategies I think are easiest to achieving a turn count of under 150 with 5 cycles. Mobius came out not too long ago and you have until sometime in November to get the turn limited banners. This is going to be a guide to help you improve your clear speed for each of the fights by giving you general tips for each fight, beyond just deal a lot of damage, because you already know that part. I also won't be taking into account Dietzi Rodia, Molar Yi Sang, Molar Otis, or any other ID or Ego that comes out in the future, since this is being recorded before they've been released. Since this is endgame content, we'll be assuming that you have every ID you plan on using at level 35. This isn't going to be me telling you what IDs to bring, or what to have at Uptie 4. In general, that's going to be up to you. But each character has specific IDs that work best here. For example, Yi Sang can only really run Efloresced Ego for his ID, and Rodia can really only bring Rose Spanner Workshop Representative, because those are both their only really good IDs in the long run. Meanwhile, characters like Ishmael have three viable IDs that she could use in this case. That being said, there is one thing that you absolutely have to have at Uptie 4, in my opinion, to make this railway much faster, and that's Rhyme Shank. Several of the bosses are weak to gloom, and thus inflicting sinking is going to help you deal a lot of damage. The boss at Station 6, which we will get into, specifically, becomes significantly easier to beat at a low turn count when you can inflict a lot of gloom damage. About half of the bosses in this railway are weak to gloom specifically, and sinking makes them far more tolerable to deal with. The first boss fight this time around is so that no one will cry, or just talisman doll because that's easier to say. This fight has the misfortune of being the first fight in the railway, meaning you need to be able to get your sanity up during this fight. Thankfully, this isn't too bad to do, thanks to his attacks not rolling super high for the first two turns. The main issue with this fight emerges on turns 3 and 4. On turn 3, he gains 9 protection, basically nullifying any attempt for you to deal damage through anything except to purse sinking, which he's thankfully weak to. Not only that, but on turn 4, even if you complete his gimmick properly, you have to deal with a 17 to 22 attack 3 times in a single turn. There is a way around this, but the most important detail is just bring a lot of blunt sinners for this fight. Efflorest Ego Yi Sang, the one who shall grip Sinclair, the one who grips Faust, Rose Spanner Workshop Representative Rodia, all of those help immensely with dealing damage in this fight. Slash damage is not preferred unless you can inflict a lot of fragile with those IDs. In order to get the fastest turn count on this fight, you might be tempted to focus on the arm in order to break the part with the least HP, but then you still have to deal with all of its attacks. Instead, staggering the body on turn 2, and it has to be turn 2, will not only delay his blocking phase for an entire turn, but it will give you a full turn to just deal damage to it while it's staggered. If you don't manage to kill it on this turn, don't worry. It should be on very low health, and you may be able to finish it off while it's blocking. If not, you will definitely be able to finish it off on the turn it uses its most powerful attacks before it gets a chance to use them. Leaving the arm unstaggered should allow you to stagger it on the next turn it attacks, so you can instantly stagger it in order to deal double damage to the arm that turn. If it's the first fight of the railway, aim to win the fight in around 5 turns, but on repeat encounters you should be able to consistently beat it in 4 and even 3 turns with some luck. The Steam Transport Machine is the first new fight introduced in this railway, and also one of the most annoying. It is also weakest to blunt, but resists gloom, so it's not as good to bring sinking this time. That said, the same heavy hitters from the last fight still work here, in addition to W Corp Don thanks to it being weak to Sloth, and R Corp Heathcliff thanks to him being weak to Envy. The best strategy seems to be to try to break the Steam Blaster on the first turn, regardless of whether it starts with the turn with Protection or Fragile. A boosted Quick Suppression from R Heath will always at least stagger the Steam Blaster as long as you flip all heads, so he is specially equipped for that. The reason you want to do this is because it will allow you to inflict far more fragile for the rest of the fight. Now that the Steam Blaster is broken, the robot will gain fragile equal to the amount of poise they gain. Whenever it is using the skill called 5384, have your fastest two units clash with that to inflict this 6 fragile as early into the turn as possible. This is just to maximize your potential damage output for each turn, and he uses this skill every other turn or so. You need to deal as much damage as possible before breaking the body, because afterwards all of its resistances will become ineffective permanently. Usually this will happen while it has somewhere between 200 and 600 health afterwards. Hitting through this can potentially take a couple of turns, so it helps to be willing to accept a turn count of 5 to 7 in this fight in order to not burn yourself out. 
At cycles 4 and 5, the robot will also restore its HP after you've dealt a certain amount of damage. It's only 200 HP even after selecting the railway buff that improves its self-healing by 30%, so it will prolong the fight by at most one turn provided you keep inflicting the fragile from its skills at the start of the turn. The turn count here is super inconsistent due to it sometimes starting with protection, sometimes with fragile, and the overall bugginess of its resistance is changing. With good luck, you can beat this fight in three turns using this strategy, but it should never take longer than seven turns with bad luck. Drifting Fox is probably the most annoying fight in the entire railway thanks to it gaining more protection as you progress through your cycles, capping out at six protection by your fifth cycle. Turn 1 and 2 will always be the same. It uses 4 attacks from its head on turn 1, and 4 attacks from its body on turn 2. The body is weak to pierce damage, while the head is weak to slash damage. Both body parts are weak to gloom, meaning it's another fight where sinking helps dramatically. Knowing that its body only uses multiple attacks on even-numbered turns means you can gimp its power pretty easily by using chains of others. You reduce its power by a lot, allowing you to clash with those skills more consistently, since they roll just a bit too high to consistently win against at high sanity. You'll know when to do this because there will only be one green skill being used, and as a result, Rhino Mersault actually works pretty well here. When it comes to dealing damage overall, your main goal is to break the head as soon as possible. It has much less total HP, so you'll be able to deal significantly more damage once it's gone. When the fox summons its umbrellas, target those down as quickly as possible while also sometimes using chains of others against the body if you want. Since he resists blunt, you won't take very much damage from thorns, so it's safe to do. In later cycles, defeating all 5-6 to six umbrellas is going to be a bit tricky, so aim to have no more than 2 umbrellas alive by the end of the turn for the best results. It makes its AoE clashable with some higher rolling ego, and you can finish them off using an AoE of your own before the fox gets to use its AoE during the turn getting rid of its power boost. Zvi Gregor is actually really strong here, as are W Corp Ryoshu, Chef Ryoshu, Molar Ishmael, and W Don, but 7 Faust and 7 Heathcliff both deal good damage here as well in case your strategy focuses on rupture. The fourth station has some T Corp guys to deal with. Your first two times approaching this fight, if you bring a heavy pierce team, it isn't unreasonable to kill both of them in a single turn, each by just focusing them down. You don't have to beat them like this, taking three turns is still fine when trying to go for a sub-150 clear. The biggest thing to watch out for is their Golden Time passive. It triggers between 24 and 96 HP, fully healing them and undoing their stagger. They stagger at 184 HP, which is still well above the threshold, so as long as you don't over-damage them, it should hopefully not be an issue, though if you trigger Golden Time, it's reasonable to restart. The third and fourth times you fight T-Corp add a second wave. This doesn't change anything about the fight itself. You can use the exact same strategy to defeat them. The fight now just takes twice as long. The best IDs in this case are Rabbit Heath, Efflores, Ego, Yi Sang, Molar Ishmael, W and Sink Don, Chef Ryoshu, and Corp Faust, and any ID that can deal decent pierce damage. A good clear of this fight is 2 to 4 turns the first two times, and 4 to 6 turns every time after that. Fey Lantern is not very interesting, as it's basically just a damage check. First things first, focus on slash damage. W Corp Ryoshu, Chef Ryoshu, R Corp Mersault, Zvi or G Corp Gregor, 7 Otis, 7 Faust, etc. The first phase will force you to break the fairy before you can harm the boss itself. The first two times you fight it, you will have four sinners to do this with, as three will be enchanted. Every subsequent time this phase starts, as well as from the fifth cycle onwards, will only allow you three sinners to break the fairy. The best single skill to do this with is what is cast, Rhodia's base ego. The fairy takes four times as much damage from this skill thanks to it being weak to both pride and slash. That attack alone will deal around 80% of the fairy's HP at a minimum, so finishing it off won't be too challenging from there. Once the fairy is destroyed, you will have a single turn to damage the body unless you stagger it. Since this abnormality only has a speed of 1, you can focus on killing it without worrying about clashing, since failing to stagger it will likely result in a retry anyways if you're going for turn count. You can treat this like you would a second fairy turn, just use what is cast as your biggest moves to stagger it as quickly as possible. One thing to note is that while in other fights your first turn skills aren't randomized, they will be randomized for the sinners who were charmed on the first turn, allowing you to bring units who had bad skills at the end of the last fight to re-roll into better abilities. Once it's staggered, just deal as much damage as you can the next turn. 
If you fail to kill it, just repeat the process and you will be able to finish it off on turn 5. The only turn counts you should be taking from this fight are either 3 or 5, since this is just how long the fight will last if you beat it optimally. Shock Centipede is the most reset heavy fight in the entire railway due to how much of an impact RNG ends up having. That being said, a good clear of this fight will usually be under par in terms of turn count. It's weakest to Pierce, Blunt, and Gloom damage, so whatever you bring to the Talisman Doll fight will work well here too. The first turn is one that confuses a lot of people. Despite the fact that the head gains shield, you want to focus on dealing enough damage to it to hit over that shield. This reduces its starting self-charge to zero and applies three fragile to all of its parts for the next turn. The easiest way to do this is to inflict as much sinking as you can, which is why Rhymeshank being at up tie 4 is so helpful. A single overclocked Rhymeshank will always inflict 160 damage worth of sinking to the head, as well as the attack itself dealing quadruple damage since it's both of the head's weaknesses. Prioritize targeting the head with your attacks just in general. While the Shock Centipede is using high voltage or electrical discharge, its AoE, which is always used on turn 2, Try to clash with it using the lowest speed sinner possible. It gains 8 self-charge through combat start effects every turn, but you can reduce it by winning your clashes against all of his skills that aren't the AoE. This is important to do BEFORE clashing with the AoE, because it gains plus 1 power in a clash for every self-charge it has. The AoE itself is strong enough that, if it hits, you are always going to restart the fight, so this is the first major hurdle and one of the big reasons why breaking the head is important. As long as you win every clash every turn, it should never have any left by the time it reaches 1 HP, meaning it will immediately die at the end of that turn. Prioritize targeting the head to deal as much damage as possible, and it's okay to take a single turn to let it deplete its self-charge at the end by winning your clashes. If it has more than 9 self-charge at 1 HP, probably just restart, since that's a guaranteed 2 more turns that you'll have to spend. A good clear of this fight using this strategy should last around 3 to 5 turns. The downside is that since this is so heavily dependent on RNG, you're probably going to be retrying a lot in order to get a good clear even this way. There's unfortunately no way to circumvent this in this case. The Fairy Gentleman fight is really easy to do. He has a pretty daunting health pool, but you can pretty easily get your clear time down to 3-4 to four turns in your first encounter with him by just focusing down his arm with a pierce team, since it takes double damage from it. Not only that, but Quick Suppression deals 4 times damage to the arm even when it's unstaggered, meaning our Heath is a must for speed clearing this fight. I can't say the same about the second encounter in this station, which forces you to fight both Fairy Gentlemen and Fairy Longlegs in the same encounter, with a combined total of around 3700 HP. The most consistent strategy for this fight seems to be to pick one and focus on dealing the majority of your damage against them. Whichever you pick is mostly up to you, but I prefer to take out the Fairy Gentleman first since he is capable of healing himself. The main strategy still boils down to targeting the body part with the least HP on each enemy, and using all of your attacks on that slot whenever possible. There is one thing to look out for, her out, however. At one point, both fairies will use their most powerful attack on the same turn to summon a minion next turn. For Fairy Gentleman, this attack only rolls a maximum of 15, which is pretty easily surmountable, very long legs, however, still rolls up to 28 with his attack, which is much harder to roll over. Once the minions have appeared, if you aren't confident that you can kill Fairy Gentleman on this turn, somebody has to defeat the Fairy Wine that he summons, otherwise he's going to do absurd amounts of damage to whoever gets targeted. If you're prioritizing Fairy Long Legs, just destroy the Wine and Clover and continue attacking him until he dies. If you focused Fairy Gentleman, however, Fairy Longlegs will only counter until the Clover is destroyed, meaning you can effectively ignore him until the Fairy Gentleman is completely dead. While the protection the tall guy gets is annoying, it will only impact your damage against him for one turn, and the counters themselves don't even activate unless you attack them. The same goes for Gentleman's Evades. They do nothing if you don't target that body part, so you can still attack the arm without issue. I'm not sure what the optimal turn count for this fight would be, so aim for 6-8 to eight turns. Using the strategies for the other fights is bound to save you a few turns by this point, so it's okay to spend a little longer here. Wayward Passenger is the last fight before the Terminus, and has a little bit of nuance to it. Firstly, the most important thing to pay attention to is his counter skill. Make sure whoever is being hit by it isn't going to end up being staggered afterwards. This fight revolves around winning your clashes to reduce his charge, just like with Shock Centipede, 
except that letting him gain charge doesn't matter as much since it doesn't necessarily prolong the fight. As with any multi-part abnormality, focus your attacks against the same arm to maximize damage output. Wayward Passenger has no physical weakness and resists pierce damage, but he is weak to both lust and gluttony damage. Once he teleports away on turn 2, you need to try and break all the portals in a single turn, or else the fight is going to be extended significantly. If you absolutely can't manage it, the portals that absolutely must be destroyed are the ones that increase his max HP and his coin power, since those will make winning much more difficult. Each portal is weak to the damage type that matches the block they use, so Gluttony for green, Wrath for red, Gloom for blue, and Sloth for yellow. Provided that you break all four portals in the first turn that they appear, the passenger will gain no buffs and will take two to three turns after to teleport again, allowing you to do much more damage overall. A good clear of this fight can last between five and seven turns using this strategy, not that there's much strategy to it to be honest. Bring your hardest hitting IDs and be able to kill each more arm more e quickly, and be ready to use AoE Ego to deal with the portals when they appear. The Terminus fight this time around is against the Sign of Roses, which is a pretty easy fight to get through. It has no weaknesses and no resistances that you can deal with, so just bring your sinners with the highest damage potential. Ebony Stem and Yisang Sun Shower are very much recommended for this fight, since you'll want attacks which target multiple enemies. On turn 1, just attack the flesh. There isn't anything you can do against its AoE, so attacking the flesh allows you to not be inflicted with the debuffs that hitting a blocking sign would give you. Once the roses have spawned, you'll want to focus your attention on destroying them. Each rose has its own gimmick, but they can mostly be ignored as long as you're clashing with them or staggering them before they can attack. If you don't destroy the roses within 4 turns, the sinner attached to them will automatically die and you'll lose a bunch of ego resources, which will result in a reset. The big exception to this rule is with the Wrath Rose. If you want the killing blow to be relatively weak, since your sinner will take an equal amount of damage in return on killing it, do not use self-destructive purge to kill a Wrath Rose. Each rose is weak to its own damage type, just like the portals are in the previous fight. You will occasionally get an abnormality event during this fight, giving you the option to accept or refuse. If you want a fast clear for this fight, you'll want to accept each time this comes up, as it increases the damage you deal with the respective sin affinity for the remainder of the fight. Once all of the roses have been destroyed, you can direct all of your damage at the flesh for the fastest kill. Ideally, it only takes two turns to break the roses, which will give you two turns to attack the flesh before the roses are summoned again. As long as you win all of your clashes, the rest of the fight is just a damage race and you should never see a second wave of roses. Using this strategy, the fight can easily be beaten in 5 turns, or even 4 if you get lucky with your skill layouts when it comes to attacking the sign directly. Next, we need to talk about railway buffs, since those were added with this refraction railway line. In terms of buffs for your team, the options are fairly limiting. If you're running at least two charge IDs in your main team, I recommend taking charge boost at the end of cycles 1 and 3 to make skills like Rip Space, DDEDR, Mind Whip, and Vibration Compression a lot easier to activate, as it speeds up your damage by quite a lot in that regard. Sinking boost, while not the most helpful thing in the world, speeds up about half of the fights in the railway by a good amount provided that you can actually inflict sinking, which I would recommend for basically any team setup. If you're running a Rupture team specifically, Rupture Boost is also helpful. Aside from the status boost, the main choice would probably be your Sin Affinity Damage Boost, specifically Envy since most high damage skills happen to be Envy. When making your fifth boost choice, if your team is low on HP, you may also want to take the team heal to help shore up your HP for the final fight, but don't take the heals before then as you need to focus on your damage to improve your turn, turn count. If somebody dies in a fight, just restart unless the death was during Wayward Passenger and you can finish him off pretty quickly. You get to revive one sinner before the final fight if you need it. In terms of enemy debuffs, the choice is a lot easier to figure out. Opportunistic basically does nothing, since you're never going a turn without attacking the enemy anyways, so picking it first is alright. Inhaling also doesn't change much. 8% of damage taken going to heal the enemy is usually only a few points of HP anyways, and the 30% healing boost is only really relevant against Fairy Gentlemen. Accelerating also doesn't change much, but it can make fights like Shock Centipede have a bit more RNG due to sometimes rolling high speed, though Crow's Eye View by itself can entirely cancel out this enemy buff. 
Thirsting and Hardening are both very debilitating, unlike the others. But Hardening pretty much guarantees that fights will take an additional turn, with the exception of Sign of Roses, since you'll have all enemy buffs by that point anyways, and it also makes your AoE attacks target fewer enemy slots. Thirsting makes it so that your Ego will be more expensive to use during your fifth cycle, but as long as you don't spam it when you don't need to, you will hopefully have built up enough to last you the rest of the railway. Most characters only have one or two choices to be made when selecting their IDs and Ego for this railway to be optimal, so let's go over the guaranteed picks first that I would recommend, since those will never change. Ethelarest Ego Yi Sang is the only Yi Sang ID that deals enough damage to be usable in this railway, so he's a definite choice. His Teth Ego choice doesn't matter, and bringing him along for Crow's Eye View is almost required in this sense. Faust will always be using both Hexnail and Fluid Sack for her Ego. Fluid Sack specifically is very useful since you don't get any healing during the railway otherwise. Yoshu will always run Forest for the Flames and Red Eyes if you have it. Hong Lu is always going to run Roseate Desire in his Teth Ego slot since the damage is more valuable than the small heal from Soda in this case. Rodeo will always use her Rose Spanner ID because it deals substantial damage and perfectly feels two of her own Ego that both have powerful applications against bosses in this railway. Sinclair will always use Impending Day. It's just more help to generate Sin resources as opposed to getting a small HP boost. Otis will always use her 7 Association ID and will always run Sun Shower, and Gregor will always run Leisure Domain. From this point onwards, it becomes a lot more preference based. Yi Sang could run either Sun Shower or Dimension Shredder, though I prefer Dimension Shredder in this case because it doesn't encroach on any other Ego, and AoE attacks have a little bit less application in this railway than the last one. Personally, I prefer Dimension Shredder 2 since it allows him to turn the charge he gets from the charge boost into a significant amount of bonus damage. The one who grips Lobotomy Corp Remnant and Seven Association Faust all have good uses in this railway, so it's up to you to choose between them. The same goes for the choice between W and Sync Don Quixote, who always use Telepole and Fluid Sack respectively as their HE ego. Personally, I prefer using the one who grips Faust to help increase your sanity gain more quickly, and W Corp Don Quixote since Rip Space is just one of the most powerful attacks in the game, and Leap inflicts a bit of fragile with its final hit. Ryoshu's choice between IDs is between W Corp and Chef de Cuisine, and she ha also has a choice between Red Eyes Open and Fourth Match Flame since both roll very high. I would recommend only bringing 4th Match Flame if it's at up tie 4, since then it becomes AoE, and personally, I prefer to use Chef Ryoshu so that we can add a little bit more healing to the party when she gets a kill. More Salt will always be a Rhino, unless you're running a Rupture setup, in which case you'll bring W Corp for his support passive and potentially use him against Fey Lantern. Hung Lu is usually going to be Ting Tang, but you can argue that bringing K Corp and a Rupture team is worthwhile. You could also make an argument for Kurakuma Honglu, though he wouldn't be as useful due to Slash being less effective in this railway in general. Typically, I'll just go with Ting Tang Honglu since he's the most reliable. Heathcliff is going to be usually using his Rabbit ID, though you'd bring his 7 Association ID at up tie 4 if you plan on running a Rupture Squad, since his damage output in that case is actually really high. Ishmael can use any of her three-star IDs in this railway. Arcorp and Molar have very high damage output thanks to either Mind Whip and or their Sinking Infliction. Liu Ishmael is just a reliable damage dealer that helps you fuel your team with Wrath and Lust in case you don't have a lot of that otherwise. Personally, I prefer Molar Boatworks Ishmael because the Sinking Infliction is just really high with that final skill, upping your damage potential against Shock Centipede, the Talisman Doll, and Sun Shower Dog quite a bit. Sinclair is almost always going to be using his N-Corp ID unless you're running a Rupture team, in which case you'd bring Lobotomy Ego Red Sheet Sinclair, as he is the single best character at inflicting Rupture potency. N-Corp Sinclair's overall damage is just too high for me not to recommend bringing it otherwise. Gregor is probably the least useful unit overall in this railway. If you plan on bringing him to fights, use either G-Corp or Zvi in a standard team, or bring Rose Spanner in a Rupture team. If you don't plan on bringing him along, I recommend using Chef Gregor or his base ID for their healing support passives. They don't do much, but any healing is helpful in this case. And that's about all there is to it. Unfortunately, this content is hard enough that it basically requires you to have your IDs at at least up tie 3 and level 35. 
but you should be able to take some lended IDs in the meantime if you're missing a few key parts of your team. I'm going to be changing my company setup to match the setup that I use during my railway run, with the exception of new IDs that I want people to be able to use in case they want to try out new ones before having them. I hope you found the guide useful. A lot of these bosses are very finicky if you don't have a solid strategy, and these strats have all been pretty reliable to me so far. In order to get under 150 turns, remember that you have to average about 5 turns per fight, which is pretty strict, and I was having a time doing it myself. Good luck on lowering your turn counts, and try to take it slowly so you don't get burnt out on your attempts. Have a good rest of your day.